It's rare for a journalist to have the ability to perfectly capture a moment in time through his writing. It's even less common for that same writer to somehow have the ability to capture an essence of human behaviour and society that is timeless and remains as true today as it did back in the 60s. I am of course talking about Hunter S. Thompson, a figure that unfortunately as of today has become known more so as a caricature of his darkest traits as opposed to the great journalist he was. Appearing mostly as last-minute Halloween costumes worn by whacked-out edgelords or the subject of pretentious conversations between overzealous film students. I am of course guilty of both. This is of course primarily due to his most iconic piece of work, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which was later adapted into the cult classic film with Johnny Depp masterfully playing Hunter in the lead role. Despite the book being a perfect descriptor of the failure of the counter-cultural movement in the 60s and ultimate death of the hippies and protest culture that came with that is commonly celebrated nowadays more so as an entertaining drug-fueled train wreck with much of Hunter's modern appeal coming in the form of his disastrous fueled lifestyle that ultimately led to his creative demise. I personally believe this to be a massive shame. Hunter as a journalist was able to perfectly satirise an ultimately tumultuous time in modern history, consistently swaying the public opinion through his unique style of journalism known as Gonzo. Much of his work remains as relevant today as it did back then, and sits in history as a clear warning of what greed and power ultimately leads to in a society. Hunter S. Thompson was much more than just fear and loathing, whether it be his attempt to run a Sheriff of Aspen as a self-proclaimed adult lunatic just to promote some real change, or his ability to actually change the course of American political history through his writings. In the case of Hunter S. Thompson, I feel it's best we focus on his work as opposed to his lifestyle, as it may have been the case he was warning us of our inevitable demise as a society the entire time. Despite most of Hunter's work being completely reactionary to the events around him, much of his outlook and the apparent chip he had on his shoulder can be linked back to his early life. Hunter would be born to a middle class family in 1937, with much of his early life being reasonably uneventful. Hunter's life would change at the age of 14, when his father passed away, leaving his mother wholly responsible for him and his two siblings. This quickly introduced alcoholism into Hunter's life through his mother who wasn't able to cope with the death of her husband. This immediately sent the family financially into the lower middle class. Hunter would quickly become very aware of the class gap and the luxuries that were inherently given to the upper class. Despite being recognised for his journalistic talents as a teenager, Hunter would quickly become involved in the wrong crowd, consisting of mainly upper-class individuals in the same journalism class as him, and would eventually be charged as an accessory to a robbery not long before his final exams. The other individuals involved in the crime were significantly more well-off than Hunter, and were able to get out early as some of them knew the judges and the others were able to pay off the bail. Hunter was unable to do either, unfortunately, and would be kept behind bars for 30 days, missing his final exams exams and therefore his graduation. Unaware of what else to do, he'd quickly enlist in the United States Air Force. It would be under service that Hunter would land his first professional writing job as the sports editor of the Command Courier. He received the role after he simply flat out lied about his previous experiences in similar roles. He would travel the US following the Eglin Eagles football team and writing about each game. He would continue his service within the Air Force for three years before he was recommended to take an early honourable discharge. It was suggested by his superiors that his rebellious attitude at times outweighed his talent and began to rub off on other staff members. After his service, he would begin freelancing articles for various newspapers, spending extended periods of time in different countries to write for the English sections of local papers, at one point even becoming a bowling reporter for a Puerto Rican newspaper, a fact he later despised. Despite his hard work, as of 1962, Hunter was barely earning enough to support his now pregnant wife. It had reached a point at times where Hunter was forced to source the food for his family himself, often hunting elk. Despite his lack of financial success, Hunter would use this time to master his writing style, often rewriting The Great Gatsby in its entirety in order to hone in the rhythm and flow of the writer he admired so much. It would be also around this time that Hunter would move to a hippie-infested Hate ashbury in San Francisco and pretty immediately became engulfed by the subculture, beginning to utilise the dextro and to aid his writing, which is essentially just ADHD medication, akin to adult, as well as a tasty amount of 
Kentucky, as was accustomed for the time. Hunter would get his first journalistic big break whilst living amongst the hippies of Haight-Ashbury. In 1965, the Nation editor, Carrie Williams, would hire Hunter to write an article on the motorcycle gang the Hells Angels. Hunter would oblige and two months later had the article ready. Upon publication, Hunter would receive various book offers and decided to spend the next year researching the book. So how did he prepare, might you ask? Well, he decided to literally live with the Angels, essentially becoming an honorary member, which in turn meant he had to be a part of all the violent activities the gang were a part of. This was extremely dangerous, as the violent gang had an inherent mistrust of reporters. Despite their usual mistrust, the Angels would become close to Hunter talking at length with the journalist and reviewing early drafts on the tape recorder to fact check anything he may have said. The gang would even visit his family home, which obviously massively pissed off his wife and neighbours. Despite the consistent threats of violence within his home, Hunter remained comfortable, simply pointing at his double barreled shotgun in response. The good relations would quickly fade as Hunter S. Thompson would receive a brutal beating by a group of angels. This would occur after Hunter began to witness an angel named Junkie George beating his wife and dog. Hunter would respond by saying, only a punk beats his wife and dog. This resulted in a beating that marked the end of the book's research. Upon release, the book would become extremely successful, although received a mixed response from those involved. An angel would come face to face with Thompson on CBS, describing the book as cheap trash, whilst also defending the actions of the angel that had beat his wife, which for some reason got a roar in cheer from the crowd. The fact that Hunter is the lone person in this huge room that actually sees domestic violence as disgusting really showed how ahead of his time he was as an individual and a journalist. Despite the fact the book was a top seller, Hunter was unimpressed with its performance. It did, however, show him that there was a market for journalism related to the freak show that was 60s subcultures, and Hunter didn't just want to peek into the madness, he wanted to smash through the window. Subsequent to this, Hunter began to immerse himself deeper into the Haight-Ashbury scene, becoming good friends with the band Jefferson Airplane. Despite the positivity of the hippies in Haight-Ashbury, much of Hunter's optimism had disappeared a few years earlier after the murder of JFK. He saw past much of the joy of the hippie movement, specifically writing about how they had lost all their political conviction, instead entirely focused on their pursuit of drugs. He no longer saw the movement as a thrust for change, instead an attempt to escape the reality of anti-war as well as generational and racial conflicts that were plaguing the country at the time. Despite the hippies' lack of political conviction, the country was still ripe with protest, with much of the public becoming disenfranchised with the American government, war and extreme racism and sexism, leading to the formation of new age journalism like Rolling Stone, which would later become Hunter S. Thompson's long-time journalistic home. It would also be around this time that Hunter became obsessed with both firearms and the usage of LSD, becoming accustomed to the destruction of violence that seemed like a fitting activity to coincide with the chaos of the times. In 1968, Hunter had decided to morph his journalistic focus into primarily politics, with the eventual goal being a book exploring the death of the American dream. Despite already being opposed to the Vietnam War, it would be the 1968 Chicago riots that changed Hunter politically. Two months after the death of Martin Luther King, Hunter would visit the Chicago Democratic Convention with the expectation of witnessing the death of the American dream. During the clash between anti-war protesters and police, Hunter described beatings that far surpassed what he had seen with the angels in terms of violence. He had described himself as a raving beast after witnessing these events, returning to his wife and kids, distraught, brought to tears, describing the American dream as clubbing itself to death. This combined with the murder of JFK and MLK signaled the end of an era of hope. Hunter knew he had to do more, which eventually resulted in the beginning of his working relationship with Rolling Stone magazine. Hunter knew he couldn't cause any real change through national politics, so pointed his attention towards Aspen, Colorado. Rolling Stone's article, The Battle of Aspen, would detail Joe Edwards' run for mayor within Aspen, with Thompson as his campaign manager. At the time, Aspen, Colorado was a surprisingly peaceful, although politically split place, and contrasted heavily with the chaos of the rest of America. Hunter had made Aspen his home in 1968, and had become tired of the local government, who seemed to only care about profit, consistently selling off Aspen's natural beauty for a quick buck. In 1968, Hunter would decide to join a local hippie supporting lawyer Joe Edwards in his run for mayor as his quote-unquote 
drug addicted campaign manager, despite the fact they both fully represented counterculture, which didn't have a place in politics at the time, Edwards and Thompson would only lose by eight votes with the close loss mainly being a result of the previous mayor's anti-constitutional cruel tirade against the hippies. Regardless of the reason, Thompson had realised he could make a serious political impact upon Aspen and decided to run for sheriff in 1970 alongside his newly formed political campaign, Freak Power. Thompson would begin his campaign with various wall posters consisting of Thompson's writings as well as art by Tom Benton, with each poster focusing on various topics from police injustices to the death of the American dream. The war posters would immediately become successful, selling out all over the area. Fueled by LSD, Freak Power would launch various bewildering campaign tactics towards the general public, quickly turning the run into national news, with the general public becoming fascinated by what they perceived as a hippie running for sheriff. The whole thing was so ridiculous that even Hunter himself saw it as a publicity stunt at first, with the intention being to distract his opponents from more fitting candidates. This was before it had become obvious that Hunter actually had a good chance of winning, so much so that the Democrats and Republicans were forced to join forces in order to defeat Freak Power. Despite Hunter's quick wits and a campaign that trumped all others in terms of creativity, Freak Power would lose the election. Regardless of the loss, Hunter had caused real change, with the forthcoming mayors and sheriffs being more akin to the ideologies of Hunter and the hippies. What remains interesting about Hunter's run for sheriff in Aspen is is the fact that much of the ideologies he pushed for are still being passionately discussed to this day, involving the decriminalisation of drugs and reformation of a violent police force. Hunter had continued to build infamy through his efforts in Aspen and without much time to think immediately returned to full-time journalism, combining his efforts with the legendary artist Ralph Steadman and with just a few years and an unhealthy amount of drugs managed to change journalism forever with the invention of gonzo journalism. What the f*** is a gonzo, you may be asking? Well, gonzo is an entirely subjective form of journalism, with the story coming from the first-person perspective of the writer, sharing their experiences and beliefs through sarcasm and exaggeration. This in turn means nothing can be taken at face value, as opposed to the inherent facts of traditional journalism. Gonzo aims to critique and satirise by showing the audience specific events as opposed to actually telling them facts. For example, traditional journalism would involve the scores and happenings within a sports game. Gonzo would involve a satiric description of the actions of audience members through the eyes of a humorous, although untrustworthy writer who may or may not be on a ton of elements urging you to make up your own mind on the state of sports fan culture. Hunter would combine autobiographical incidents with pure fabricated fiction to achieve this style of writing. Despite Gonzo's purposeful definition, it was actually created entirely by accident after Hunter was tasked to cover a horse race named the Kentucky Derby. Upon arriving, he would notice the depravity of the alcohol fueled crowd, focusing much of his notes on the people attending as opposed to the actual event. Upon returning, Hunter became frustrated with the lack of story related to the event and decided to haphazardly combine ripped out pages from his notebook he had been scribbling in whilst attending the event on resulting in an article that explored the depravity of the general public upon a backdrop of political unrest from the recent Cambodia expansion in the Vietnam War and the Kent State shootings. Hunter was embarrassed upon sending the article off, assuming his lack of a coherent story would result in the end of his journalistic career. Instead, he had created an entirely new style of journalism that would later be described by the editor of the Boston Globe at the time as pure gonzo. It was obvious gonzo could only go in one direction from here, fear and loathing. Shortly after the Kentucky Derby, Hunter would receive a job offer from Sports Illustrated to cover the Mint 400 off-road motorcycle race in Las Vegas. He was tasked to develop captions for a photo essay regarding the event. Upon arriving at the event alongside his attorney, Oscar Zeta Acosta, Hunter would become frustrated by the staggered race start times as well as the large amount of dust clouds that made it difficult to see anything. He chose to reside in the journalist 
intent feverishly writing an essay exploring gambling and American excess, this essay topic might seem completely out of the blue considering the event he had attended, however, it makes perfect sense when exploring Hunter's mindset at the time. He had just left East LA, where he had been investigating the suspicious death of journalist Ruben Salazar, alongside activist Oscar Zeta Acosta. Salazar, who had been extremely critical of the actions of the police force, would be sitting within a bar when a nearby riot broke out. During the riot, the police would send a gas canister into the bar, where it hit Salazar in the head, ultimately leading to his death. Thompson and Acosta had become suspicious of this proposed story, and as their investigation progressed, it became clear foul play and corruption may have been at fault. It would be this situation that led Hunter and his attorney to Vegas, with the derby just being a thinly veiled excuse. Activist and attorney Oscar Zeta Acosta, who was played by Benicio Del Toro in the film, worried that his reputation would become dampened if he was seen with a journalist, who by many in the activist scene were seen as mouthpieces for government propaganda. This was combined with the obvious paranoia the two were feeling as they continued to unearth corruption directly under the noses of the Los Angeles police. Hunter suggested a trip to Vegas to discuss the murder outside the watchful gaze of Los Angeles activists and law enforcement, where the two would eventually attend the motorcycle race. Upon returning from his trip, Hunter submitted an essay that had reached a word count of over 10 times what he had been hired to do. It was immediately rejected. This essay would form the early rumblings of fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Hunter had been obsessed with the death of the American dream for many years and saw Las Vegas as its location. He immediately rented a Cadillac, called the owner of Rolling Stone and demanded he pay for it, exclaiming, I can't cover the American dream in a goddamn Volkswagen. He would return to Las Vegas alongside Acosta under the guise of covering a conference on the danger of narcotics, but his real goal was to finish Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and truly find the death of the American dream. He spent much of his time driving around interviewing random individuals about the American dream. For those of you that may have seen the film or read the book, you may be wondering, where do I start talking about the metric the f ton of drugs? described in the novel. Well, in the true style of Gonzo, much of that is a work of pure fiction. In reality, Hunter and Acosta were only abusing alcohol, marijuana, and an ADHD medication called Dexedrine. Don't be fooled, however, these drugs still have nasty side effects, leaving Hunter sleep-deprived and paranoid, with the majority of the novel being written whilst Hunter was literally having a panic attack. The novel describes two outcasts, named Rahul Duke and Dr. Gonzo, going on a drug binge through Las Vegas with the goal to find the American dream. The final product is a masterpiece that accurately describes the failure of the countercultural movement within the 60s, with all hope being washed away by a wave of tragic events ultimately caused by the actions of a corrupt government. Acosta would eventually disappear in Mexico three years later. It's suspected he may have been murdered by drug dealers or state agents, or just simply overdosed. The case is still unsolved. The writings from these two trips would originally be released as a two-part article for Rolling Stone. It would be received so well, he was approached to adapt it into a full-length novel named Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Upon release, the novel would predictably receive negative reviews from clueless, decrepit critics, although as it became popular, became commonly considered as one of the most important pieces of American literature from that era. After the success of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter quickly became the most valuable writer at Rolling Stone, with founder Jan Venner agreeing to assign Thompson as a full campaign correspondent for the 1972 presidential election, with the promise of a book deal afterwards. Hunter would quickly begin in 1971, in Washington DC covering the primary elections. What quickly became apparent when Hunter showed up is the fact that nobody paid him much attention, or even seemed to know who he was, allowing him to accurately watch and connive from the sidelines without being bothered by anybody else. This would quickly change however, and Hunter became infamous amongst the politicians as the articles began to roll out within Rolling Stone. They covered every detail of the campaign, in as much vulgar, exaggerated detail as possible. Hunter would quickly favour candidate George McGovern, savagely insulting and critiquing any other candidate. One of the funniest examples is Hunter continuously implying Edmund Musk is abusing the drug 
like Ibogaine, which ended up becoming mainstream news. This was of course fabricated, he was never abusing Ibogaine. When Hunter was criticised on the clear fake news, he would simply respond saying, I never said he was abusing Ibogaine, I said there was a rumour he was abusing Ibogaine that started in Michigan, I started the rumour in Michigan. Another key theme of the book is Thompson's sheer hatred of Richard Nixon, who would eventually win the campaign. Hunter would release all his findings in the book Fear and Loathing on the campaign trail. Many at the time criticised the book for spreading lies and propaganda against certain candidates, but I believe that misses the point. The book is also a critique against journalism as a whole, satirising journalists with inherent bias who form tight-knit relationships with politicians, skewing their credibility and the power of the piece of journalism in general. McGovern's campaign manager would later state how fear and loathing on the campaign trail is the least factual but most accurate account of the campaign trail that year. The book would perform extremely well and is again seen as an extremely important piece of political literature that has remained extremely relevant during every campaign trail since 1972. Despite the book's success, many see the campaign trail as the end of Thompson's journalistic prime. He had become such a household name amongst the individuals involved in current events that he was no longer able to attend political events without being swarmed for autographs and handshakes, essentially becoming more famous than most of the people he was trying to cover. Rolling Stone continuously struggled to find a story big enough for the talent of Hunter S. Thompson, who was eventually tasked to cover the Muhammad Ali, George Foreman fight in Africa in 1974, dubbed the Rumble in the Jungle. It had seemed like a perfect topic for Hunter. He had always respected the political activism completed by Ali throughout the Vietnam War and would be perfect to cover the inherent insanity of the event. Unfortunately, Hunter would give away his tickets and spend the entire fight laying naked in the hotel pool, drinking whiskey and throwing ma- in the water, slowly watching it dissolve. Muhammad Ali would knock out Foreman in an iconic upset, which was entirely missed by Thompson. He had returned home without anything that even resembled a story. This marked the beginning of his decline. Due to his iconic works in the previous years, Hunter had become a household name and sort of cult figure. This led him to believe he was a rock star akin to the musicians of the era. A year before the Ali fight, he had tried cocaine for the first time, which quickly became a habit, heavily taxing his ability to write and be creative. And after failing to complete a story on the war in Vietnam, Hunter would have many of his future projects cancelled by Rolling Stone. They had lost trust in his ability to complete a story. This included his plan and to look at the 1976 election, which was cancelled entirely. Despite this, he would still write a 10,000 word essay endorsing Jimmy Carter, which is seen by many as being an important factor to Carter's eventual presidency. Hunter stopped writing full-time articles and would consistently have individuals at his house for extensive partying and drug use. His articles continuously became less funny and creative. All this eventually became too much for Hunter's wife who would divorce him after finding a tape recording of one of his many affairs. The same same year as Hunter's divorce saw the release of Where the Buffalo Roam, a loose film adaptation of Hunter's work. This continued to skyrocket his name in the eyes of the public. This combined with a comic strip adaptation of Rahul Duke destroyed the mental state of Thompson. He felt he was forced into the persona he had written for himself and felt constant pressure to act in a certain way which only further encouraged the drug use, leading to Thompson routinely turning up to television interviews f***ed up beyond comprehension. Despite adding to his infamy in the eyes of the public, it only dampened his creative flair. Throughout his entire life, Hunter had always accepted the idea that his death would eventually come by self-deletion and commonly shared this with his loved ones. When meeting his second wife in 2003, he promised her 10 more years. This promise would unfortunately be broken. For decades, Hunter had felt the pressure of Gonzo, being forced into a persona that is always going to be larger than life. His drug use had also dampened his creativity and sharpness. He no longer had the sheer intelligence he once had and that ate at him. This was combined with multiple health issues such as a hip replacement that meant he was in constant pain. He knew in 2005 it was his time. He would choose a sunny day at his lifelong farm residence where he was surrounded by family. Hunter would be on the phone to his wife Anita whilst setting up the with Anita mistaking the cocking of the gun for his typewriter. The gun 
shots would come shortly after his wife had hung up. His body would be discovered by his son. His funeral involved his ashes being shot out of a cannon that was sat atop a giant tower in the shape of the Gonzo Fist, originally used for his Aspen campaign many years ago. The later life of Hunter S. Thompson can be seen as tragic. The line between his actual persona and his literary self had become so blurred, he was forced into a life that was self-destructive and ultimately damaging for his professional career. His Gonzo persona became so inherently linked with him that many people today just remember him for his fueled life, with Joseph Rogan reading out his later life daily routine being one of the most popular references on the internet today. Despite the fact that daily routine was quite literally fake and written in the pure style of Gonzo, when a journalist was attempting to cover Hunter S. Thompson later in his life. Despite his reputation, he spent the majority of his journalistic career as an incredibly sharp and intelligent writer that managed to capture an era in time through writings that somehow feel relevant regardless of the time period you're reading them in. It's as if he was trying to warn us. Whether it be Hunter during the late 60s being the lone individual against domestic abuse in a room crowded full of people, or his attempt to end police brutality before society had even realised how bad it could get, Hunter's ability to not only explore but satirise the political and social landscape is something that will never be replicated and always will be missed. And with the divide that is currently plaguing much of the West, perhaps Hunter's intelligent or those satirical look at politics and the world is something we need today more than we ever have. Ah!